Maxine is going to talk to us about CARE, C-A-R-E. Maxine is a senior lecturer in rheumatology. She served on the Committee for Professional Affairs for the Australian Rheumatology Association. And she's also been chair of the Committee for Quality and Safety for the Australian Rheumatology Association. She's an invited speaker for many public health e educational events. She's an enthusiastic advocate for the health and well-being of the medical profession, uh, equal to the health and well-being of the patients, of course. And she blogs on these matters, which makes her a bit of a teenager, I reckon. Uh, Maxine, thank you very much. Okay, cool. All right, my last name is Shramka. I have one vowel in my name, okay? No one complain about it. <laughs> You're lucky there's one there. I've often joked about marrying a Croatian guy and hyphenating my name, so I'd be Shramka hyphen Chisilovsky or something like that. Could you that. speak up, Luke? Oh, yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? You. you missed all my jokes. That's terrible. <laughs> I'm sorry, you missed out. I've got to carry on. The clock's ticking. Okay. So I'm going to speak about making care the foundation of healthcare regulation. Obviously, um, the regulation of healthcare is very topical here. Um, we work in an industry called healthcare, and uh, it's interesting to consider what do we think of when we consider the word healthcare. Like it's one of those things that we kind of take for granted. We're in the healthcare profession, but then I have to question where is the care in the healthcare profession? Like what happened to the word care? Like did it get dropped off somewhere? Do we call it health? something. <laughs> like, um, if we call it health care, we have to accept that there's a foundational principle of care that actually exists within the profession, whether we be in medicine, whether we be in um, allied health professionals, whether we be in nursing, wherever we are in healthcare, even if we're administrators in healthcare, the foundational principle of healthcare is care, and that is care for people. So, foundation is caring for people. Without people, we don't have health care. And that's caring for the health and well-being of all people. That's not just people that come to seek healthcare services, it's all people. And healthcare professionals are people too, despite our titles. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is very much missing at the moment in healthcare is care for healthcare, care for healthcare professionals. And that's nowhere more manifest than in the healthcare regulation system and the way people are treated within the healthcare regulation system. So, let's examine, understanding the foundation of healthcare being care for all people, what is the current foundation of the healthcare regulation system? One would expect that if you have a healthcare system, that the foundational principle of all areas within that system would be the same and it would be universal. One would expect and understand automatically from foundational principles that the foundation of all aspects of the healthcare system would be care for all people, whether you are delivering healthcare or whether you're receiving healthcare. So, what do we have? <coughs> the foundation of the healthcare regulation system is to protect the public and keep the public safe. Automatically in that, there's an adversarial system that's set up. Uh, there's an inherent bias against the medical and the healthcare professions because it implies within that statement that people within the healthcare profession are just waiting should they get the opportunity any moment now when no one is looking i'm going to harm that person <laughs> did you see it happen i got away with it thank god <laughs> um, so there's inherent bias and there's this thing that we have to be draconian we have to watch over everyone because they're going to hurt people but who are the sort of people that choose to do healthcare? like are they mass murderers saying you know what my alternative career plan, I'm not going to succeed here, so I'm going to become a doctor. Or, you know, like, um, I'm going to become a nurse because that's going to be the way I can get away with hurting people. It's not the case. The sort of people that choose to do healthcare are those of inherently caring nature and they have the best interests of people at heart. But what happens to them? Within this very foundation of regulation, there's an assumed guilt of harm there's an investigation and punishment focus. So there's a focus on notification, and then there's a focus on punishment. We, a notification has been made, therefore there has to be an investigation. We all know an investigation has to have a sentencing, and then there has to be a punishment, or you're not seen to be doing your job of protecting the public who are so vulnerable that they're going to be hurt all the time by every single person who's in this profession that we should really do away with because it's so harmful. <laughs> so it creates a fear 
Like it creates an absolute binding fear of those in the healthcare profession, whatever industry you're in. It's like, oh my God, I do not want to go through an investigation. This is going to be terrible. It's going to be the worst experience of my life. And people who see people go through it know it is actually the worst experience of your life. And you're thinking, well, I chose to do this to care for people. What's with the abuse? Like, where's the nurturing? Where's the support? Healthcare is a lifelong learning. We're all human. We're all learning. Why is there not support for learning? Why is this draconian... Um, killing system, it essentially, it destroys, it crushes people, we all know it does. It's not actually supporting people to deliver healthcare. It destroys reputation and it destroys livelihood. There's no focus on learning and there's no focus on growth and there's no focus on support for anyone to become a, a better practitioner. It's like, you made a mistake, that's it, you're out, your life is over. It's uh, many doctors and it's been written in the literature, not just a word on the street in the professions. The process is being described as being accusatory, bullying and intimidating. Uh, there's a process of you're guilty until you're proven innocent, which is in contravention to basic standards of uh, civil justice, where you're absolutely determined to be innocent and the onus of um, proving guilt is on the prosecutor. And it's very adversarial. I mean, seriously, where's the care in that? It, it's non-existent. Like, the foundation is not an equal care for all people. It's biased against everyone who has a healthcare degree, separating them against those who access the healthcare systems. So we need to question, why is care not the foundation of all aspects of our healthcare system? We need a universal system. Otherwise, how can we call ourselves a healthcare system? I don't think we actually can. I think it's quite hypocritical. But to take it even further, can it actually succeed with an inequitable foundation? Can anything in life actually succeed if we're, not, if we're not consistent, if we have different standards? So let's take a look at the consequences of the current system, which is adversarial based on protection and punishment and fear-based. Is it working? The impact on doctors. I come from a medical perspective. So this is the impact on people who go through an investigations process. They have higher rates of cardiovascular disease, they have higher rates of new musculoskeletal complaints, and they have higher rates of flares of existing disease. There's double the rate of suicidal ideation. As we know, the suicidal ideation rate for doctors is already far higher than the general public. 25% um, of doctors at any stage have actually thought about killing themselves. That is one quarter of the population of the medical profession. That is staggering. There are higher rates of burnout. The burnout rates for doctors are already 40 to 55%. And burnout is not some benign condition where you're just tired for a couple of days. It's completely dysfunctionalizing and associated with a lot of medical complications as well. There are higher rates of depression. There's double the rate of depression. There's higher rates of anxiety, double the rates of anxiety. The rates of anxiety in doctors are already far higher than the population. You put people through a regulatory process, they get even more anxiety. And there's also marital breakdown. There's financial distress, loss of livelihood, loss of relationships, and so on. Um, a review, an Australian study, has showed that those who have gone through the medical legal process, 33% consider quitting medicine. This is like a highly trained resource, I think, I'm out. 32% consider, consider reducing their hours, creating a further strain on the profession. 40% consider early retirement, and I'm talking the age of 50 and their 40s. And these are, you know, decent people. Most people who go through the regulatory system, they're not criminals. Like, negligence is not very high up there in terms of what causes people to go through a regulation system or a medical legal inquiry. But, okay, so you might just think I'm saying, you know, poor doctors, but let's look at the patients. Is there an impact on patients from such a system? There's actually a higher cost of health care. Um, because of the way the system is structured, it means that more doctors practice defensively. 80% of doctors who are exposed to or hear of people exposed to this system practice more defensively. That's across the board. This results in patients being required to see more doctors, they're prescribed more drugs, and they're ordered more investigations. This results in delay in diagnosis and delay in treatment, as you have to, there's time waiting to see this specialist, that specialist, I better check, better get that person there, cover my bottom, go to that person there, I don't think about that, have another test. It's a shamozzle. More referrals and more tests. There's also a poorer doctor-patient relationship when you have doctors who are burnt out, who are anxious, who are suicidal. Can you imagine the quality of care and connection you're actually going to get in a consultation? Care needs to be delivered in every healthcare engagement, every interpersonal engagement. If it's not there, you do not have true healthcare. 
Um, there's a lower quality of care, as I said. There's a greater risk of side effects. More investigations, more drugs, more risk of side effects. The greater risk of receiving medical error. Um, there's been a, a studies that are reported that burnout is associated with uh, medical error, and so has depression in some studies as well. So we've got a serious issue here, and a retardation of delivery of the best healthcare, and erosion of trust in medicine. How can I trust doctors? They don't connect with me, they don't listen, I'm shunted around to specialists, I'm ordered all these tests. No one can tell me what's going on because they're all hedging to save themselves. So the impact on the healthcare system. 80% of doctors practice more defensively. The cost of defensive medicine is $124 billion a year in the USA, and that was done about 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure that figure would be far higher now. It's estimated that defensive medicine is about 15% of the cost of healthcare. That is a phenomenal proportion of any healthcare budget. And in this day and age, with increasing levels of chronic diseases, things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, musculoskeletal disease, more people are getting multiple chronic comorbidities than ever before. How are we going to be able to sustain this from a funding perspective? And how are people going to be able to fund this themselves from a personal perspective? There are higher costs to Medicare and private healthcare funds because of this. More investigations, more prescribing, more referrals. High cost for the regulatory agencies as well. Burnout causes more medical error and lower patient satisfaction. Communication errors are the highest cause of um, patients making complaints to regulatory agencies. So it's pretty clear from the data that this current system of protection is actually not working. So the inequitable, non-universal standard of care is not serving either the healthcare profession or patients. We are not getting the best quality of healthcare delivered to anyone. The health of the profession is being affected and the health of the patients are being affected. But we can't separate regulation from the existing healthcare culture. We have to look at the existing culture. The existing culture of healthcare is one that we've heard earlier. It's bullying, discrimination, harassment, con condemnation and judgment. One mistake and you're out. There's no room for error. There's open hate and hostility. I regularly hear of doctors that tell each other they hate each other and they refuse to work with them. Literally, they write emails to each other, I refuse to work with you, I hate you. Like, <laughs> literally, I'm like, why would you commit that in an email? <laughs> it's just craziness, but it, it's so out there. There's professional rivalries, people get together to drum people out of the town if they don't like them or they're jealous of them or, you know, for whatever random reason, really. Uh, there's malicious complaining that goes on that we particularly hear, hear about. It happens in hospitals, it happens with the regulatory agencies. People bitch about each other all the time. There's a culture of blame, shame and sue. I'm going to blame you, something went wrong, we don't like it, we've got to find a scapegoat, we've got to blame you, we're going to shame you in public and then we're going to make you pay. And you're going to pay off your money and your loss of reputation. But the thing is, the error, they say our current culture is error is negligence. That's not the case. Like there's a big difference between negligence and error. And our current system is error is negligent, therefore you can't practice your career ever again if you make one mistake. There's absolutely no care for doctors as people, and I know from other healthcare professionals, there's no care for other people as healthcare professionals. It's demand, it's expectations, you will perform, you will do as I say, and if you don't, well, you're not a team player, are you? Um, and there's a huge fear of losing your reputation, as reputation equals your livelihood. So people are absolutely paralysed in our current culture. The consequences of this, higher rates of suicide in doctors, up to 5.7 times, higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of high psychological distress, 25% of doctors think about killing themselves, less than 40% of doctors have their own GP, and even then it's someone they know or they're related to, which they're not supposed to do, but they do. 40 to 55% of doctors are burnt out. It's very, very clear from the data that the current systems and culture are not working. The health and well-being of all of us is very, very negatively impacted, and we need to seriously look at the foundations of our system. We need to employ a universal foundation of care for all in all aspects of healthcare. So how might we do this in the healthcare regulation system? Some people think care and they think it's touchy-feely soft. Care begets responsibility, equally so. When you care about people, you consider their well-being, you consider the well-being of all equally so. And then, of course, when there's maliciousness and the horrible things that happen, there's an accountability and responsibility. But it brings in an understanding. What's happening for that person? How have they been shaped by the system? What's going on for them? Can we bring them support? Can we rehabilitate them from a loving perspective, not from a judgmental, draconian, 
you are guilty of professional misconduct and therefore thou shalt you know, never offend again. It doesn't help anyone in the profession and it doesn't help healthcare. That doesn't mean we don't hold people responsible, but there's a way of going about it that needs to be fundamentally different. Care brings the respects of human dignity, decency and human rights, equally so, and we do not see this in our current system. And care brings a system that honours and serves all people equally so. Fear that gets PTSD. And PTSD, how do people function and practice when they've got PTSD? I mean, I remember being like a physician training. I was so anxious, I couldn't remember anything at one stage. I was paralysed. What do you want me to say? What do you want, who do I say to what? Like, it's completely schizophrenic, the way the medical system shapes you. Fortunately, I have recovered. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> moving forward, we need to consider the absolute whole system and culture in healthcare. And I'd like to propose some principles of a new system and culture, because if we don't get the foundations right, we can refine the systems until the cows come home, and then we're going to keep refining it until the roosters crow. Like, we are never going to stop refining it, and we won't get a true system until we get the foundations true. It's like you have a building, you don't have the solid foundations, you get Pisa, and then it falls over, okay? So, what I'd like to propose as a foundation is care and equal respect for all people, irrespective of what your title, your qualifications are, or your role in the healthcare is. One that places the health and well-being of all of us at its foundation, and truly so, not just paying lip service to the fact that if you're stressed, you need to phone for Beyond Blue. Okay? We need to foster values throughout the entire healthcare system, from training of all students to administration. And we need to include administration in this, because for too long, there's been a war between administrators and healthcare professionals. We're all in the same system. We're all here to care for people. We need to work together equally so. There needs to be respect, dignity and decency for all. We need to have a culture of supporting <coughs> practitioners in their lifelong development. Hippocrates long said, the art is long and life is short. And we need to appreciate this. There's more that comes in the practice of healthcare than you learn in the textbooks and then you learn anything in school or your training. And as we know, the evidence is always training and experience on the job is, brings far more wisdom than anything you can ever learn in a textbook. We all know that. We need to make healthcare about people and not process. There's too much emphasis on following due process that abrogates care, dignity and decency for all at the moment, and we're all suffering. Foundationally, error is not negligence. And we need to nurture people and not destroy them. So this would bring about, from foundational principles, an understanding that we need an equal accountability for complainants and healthcare professionals. We need consequences for vexatious complainants. We need fines, jail time, and a public register. Why do we have a register of healthcare practitioners, but not those who offend against healthcare practitioners? Are we to be silent? Are we the ones to be abused freely with actually no voice? That is inequitable in society. We all have equal human rights, and we need to honor that practically so. Don't investigate vexatious complaints. Why investigate them? Why play into someone's personal agenda and put someone through an investigation? Use discernment and say, no, I'm not playing that game. We need to instill the principle of first do no harm. Health and well-being is important, not what the accepted practice is. As we know, the evidence base is always changing. Countless reviews of the evidence is actually showing that we actually can't rely on the written evidence that's actually there. 40.2% of studies cannot be reproduced at the 10-year mark. And that's from the, the world's most prestigious journals. There is so much corruption, bias, and sponsorship, and so-called evidence-based science, and limitations on what can actually make it into the published literature. We can't actually use it as the gold standard in which to hold someone to account. And there's so much learning that happens in healthcare. And if we say you can only do the evidence that a certain number of people in the profession agree with, then we are limiting healthcare, and we are really serving the population very, very poorly. We need to leave room for growth. We need to have compensation for doctors who have been put through a vexatious complaint. Mm -hmm. Well, they need to be monetary uh, compensation, and they need support from the board to re-establish their reputation and peer relationships. Oh, no, I have not finished. <laughs> 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 okay. We need respectful and timely communications, but it's not just about making communications timely. We need a foundational respect for people and who they are and what they're here to do. And when it comes with that quality, people do not feel intimidated by the process. When investigations are done, they need to be done by people who are qualified in that area and not by people who don't know about it. 
and there needs to be a focus on support for learning rather than finding faults for which you can punish someone publicly for and lay them out to dry, so to speak. And we also need, this is shocking, someone excellent, can we commend them publicly? Could that be possible where you can actually say, you did a great job, this person was fantastic? Like at the moment, all we have is a register of, you know, and on the record of APRA, oh, this person's got this complaint, this complaint, this complaint, this complaint. Nothing good is on their record ever. So it's not surprising that most doctors are like quaking at the boats and they don't want to stand up to the system and other healthcare professionals as well because you're judged by one person's malicious words. And as we know on the internet, um, most people, there's, look, this is perhaps controversial, but this is what the evidence shows. On social media, there's a high tendency towards so psychopathic and sociopathic tendencies and people that you know, are really kind of vocal um, in social media. So we have to understand that there are particular motivations for people to make complaints and we need to take that into consideration and understand that doesn't reflect that person's practice and that person's relationship in the community because a lot of people don't express the good things. Just because it's not said doesn't mean it's not there. And we need to encourage that culture of sharing the excellence of people and the appreciation of that. Two minutes. I'm, I'm on to the timing. Okay, no public punishment. Do we need public punishment for people who need to improve their note taking? Like, is that something that's a crime that needs to go on the APRA website? <laughs> like, hello, like, where are we at when we need to say, yes, we investigated, you need to improve your notes. Thank you very much. That's going to be in the register for 12 months. Okay, um, I propose a register of disbarred practitioners, but not of anyone else. Like, you don't need to know, unless someone's actually a menace to the public, why do you need that actually out there? Because it's, it's there fund foundationally as a public shaming thing at the moment. Mm. And it can be grossly abused. And it can be grossly abused by someone who has like a gripe, or who wants to take that information and you know, spread that around social media, spread that around to colleagues and misuse that information. And that information at present is not there on the principle of supporting a person in the learning from the foundation of understanding that we're all learning. It's no big deal. We're all learning and let's grow. This person's amazing. Let's support them to grow further. We need to support the ongoing health and well-being, both complaints of com for communication issues, not medical negligence. We need CPD points for personal health and well-being development for all practitioners um, of their own choosing, not, not, not told what they need to do of their own choosing. We need a mentoring system which is confidential. This will do away with the isolationism in the system and that can be, mentors can be trained and that way people can share their difficult cases, what's happening, the issues that they're actually having and develop with each other in that way. We need to foster a culture of support within a profession, not uh, recriminations and condemnation and judgment. And foundationally, we need to absolutely remove adversary, remove the punishment, remove revenge and appeasement, <coughs> remove condemnation, and focus on supporting people to develop and accept errors as part of learning and accept mutual responsibility in all engagements in healthcare. You can't get true reform until the foundations of healthcare are true and lived. You will get change and more timely systems, but it will not ever remove the harm. Our entire healthcare system foundation and approaches need changing to bring a true care for all people back to healthcare. Okay, in conclusion, enormous harm is coming from the current culture and system. It has failed. We need true care for all as a very, very solid foundation in healthcare. We need equal accountability and equal responsibility for all people. We need to address the regulation system and the healthcare culture, and perhaps even shift the way everything works together. If we focus on looking at the system the way it is and refining it, we aren't ever going to get to the true, true root of things, and we're not going to truly develop the best delivery of healthcare, which is actually what it's all about. We need support and not destruction abuse, and we need the foundation and the focus to be what is best for the healthcare in each person, not punishment and not according to strict guidelines which just change from year to year. Protection and adversary begets abuse and harm, care begets responsibility and true care and the best possible delivery of healthcare. That's the end.